Before we get started, I should say, Jono, when you're listening to this and editing it, that's how you count, with the, with the same gap between all the numbers, you fuckwit. <laughs> Listeners and welcome to, I guess we're still calling it season two, but it is definitely episode fifty-eight of Bad Voltage. Uh, been a little bit of a gap here, but it's myself and Stuart Langridge. All right, actually, uh, we are missing the intrepid Jonathan Edward James Bacon the uh, third, who is unavailable for recording. But we figured there was a long enough gap that we didn't want to delay again. So uh, you have. Two of the three tasty things in your ears, which is a tagline we have not used in a long time. So kicking it a little old school there. <laughs> and but, but and we have had um, quite a few people popping up in basically every social media channel we have going, where's the show? And I'm like, what a summer break. Okay. We have. Because people have been on various holidays and had things to do and so on. A couple, couple conferences, Data Dog Summit in there, some yeah. travels. And, uh, but but we're back back to our regular cadence every other week. You can expect us for at least the next little bit, I think. So um, what we're going to do today is, is a pretty uh, traditional show, I think. First start off with a topic that both Ak and I thought was interesting. We'll discuss that and then segue into a little bit of news. And that will be your episode 58. So what are we starting with, Stuart? Right. Now, I've been, um, I had a cu- I had a couple of thoughts about various things, and then Matthew Garrett wrote a blog post which articulated my thoughts very neatly, and we'll we'll link to this post in the show notes, okay? But what he's talking about here is uh, free software licensing, and in particular, we've seen a few uh, people recently start talking about different ways we might think about licensing free software. So one of the approaches that has, that has come up has been from large companies who are simultaneously aggrieved and a bit resentful that they are building software under some kind of free software license, which is then being taken by large cloud companies, um, Amazon, Microsoft, uh, whoever, Google. And we, we've talked about that aspect of it in the yes, past. Yes, and we, ha- and we have talked about this in the past. So this is um, MongoDB and people like that who are saying, it's not fair, these companies are just deploying our software in their cloud and getting all the money and we're not getting any money. And ha- can we fix this problem with licensing? Then simultaneously to that, slightly more recently, we've also seen some people talking about how free software licensing might change to contain a more ethical edge to it. Um, Historically, there's been a lot of pushback on this kind of thing in the free software community. The idea of saying, I don't want my software to be used by uh, immigration enforcement or the military. Uh, The JSON license has said, this software should be used for good and not evil. And the free software response to this has been, in general don't do that kind of thing because we don't know what it means. It's not legally enforceable and basically means we shouldn't use your stuff at all and so on and so forth. And the very definition of free software itself includes the assertion that it must be possible to use the software for any purpose. Right. I mean, freedom zero, right? Yeah. But we're starting to hear people saying, is that the world we really want to build? And they have to my mind at least at least something of a point and yes. the 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 free software definition was created 30 odd years ago and the world has changed quite a bit in various places since then and at least when these discussions have come up before the pushback has basically been but that's not free software compliant like that is in itself enough of a reason to not do it and so so the res- so the response to the response has been oh okay i suppose then we don't get to do that because it be- it being compliant with the free software foundation's definition of free software is we want to be compatible with free software therefore we can't do this kind of thing but maybe we should be thinking is the definition of free software really doing the thing we want the goal was never just to make free software for itself it's to make a better world right to make a thing where 
everyone has access to the software that they want. Everyone has access to the things that they want. It's designed to level the playing field, to make everything available to everybody. The, the goal is not to create GPL-compliant software. That's a, that's a stepping stone on the path to a world of equality and niceness where right. everyone has the things that they want. And is... So my question to you is: Is the fr is the existing free software definition still the best way we know of to achieve that, or is the is the definition of free software maybe no longer as fit for purpose as it once was? So I, I think this is an interesting question for a couple of reasons, and that a lot of it is around, there's a lot of nuance here and a lot of different angles to take. And I think Garrett's summary is a really good summary of the problem without an actual solution to propose precisely because it's a difficult problem with that. I think a solution is going to take a lot of discussion. And if you read his post, and, and like uh, Axe said, we'll post the link to that in the show notes. If you read it, I think really part of his point is let's get the conversation started, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so I think it's clear why there's motivation to do this. I think it's clear that given the current definition of, uh, you know, the F that the FSF would have, there's really no way to bake subjective ethical usage guidelines into a license and, and still end up with what is today free software, which then leads to your question. And I, I think this is going to be difficult to do for a variety of reasons. One, it's subjective, right? So companies yeah. don't like subjective things in licensing. A lawyer wants to be able to look at something and say, I understand exactly what the company that employs me risks are associated with this, and I can make a yes-no decision on whether those risks are acceptable to this organization. And I think people, lawyers and otherwise, have a difficult enough time understanding what free software is and what the requirements are and what licenses provide. And that's, I think, underscored by the fact that the relatively clear terms of the GPL have been hard to enforce and, and haven't really been decided yet and are, are still argued today this much later. And that's even before GPL 3 added more nuance to that. So I think part of the reason it's going to be difficult to do is because of that subjectivity. Uh, you look at the JSON license as a great example of this. I, I don't know what that means. Like, yeah. you must do good or do no evil. Uh, who By whom definition, Right. So this, this is exactly things I, like that yeah. are, are going to be difficult to, to square. So then the, the decision becomes, do we want the free software movement to pivot and become something else? Will, will someone create a, an ethical software movement that is not the free software movement, but a different kind of orthogonal movement that driving social change is part of the ethos in, in a way that's a little bit different than what the free software movement's ethos is. I, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I think it's clear, you know, you look at what recently happened in the chef community is a great example of some people clearly want this, right? Enough that they will, someone who's been part of an ecosystem for a very long time is willing to pull a major part of that ecosystem out for a reason that, that is related to, to his interpretation of oh, what good and bad now, is. Can you <clears throat> summarize that a bit? Because, first of all, I only vaguely touched the edges of it, and secondly, I suspect a bunch of people listening won't know at all exactly what happened there. So, Sure. Um, so, recently, a previous employee of uh, Chef uh, named Seth had a part of uh, the, the build process of Chef that was pretty integral to, to how many people use Chef, w released it, obviously, as open source software. And because uh, it was found out that Chef had a contract, and when it actually, to be clear, wasn't even Chef, it was a, a redistributor, of, but for Chef, uh, had a contract with ICE, which is the immigration control here in the United States. Uh, he felt that he did not want his software used in the ways that he interprets what ICE does does and so pulled the software completely uh you know as kind of a social protest it broke a lot of what uh customers who use chef and a lot of the community that uses chef uh chef handled it i think in the beginning very poorly by just forking it removing all his copyrights and uploading it which is obviously regardless of where you fall in this decision was not the right way to handle it <laughs> uh realized that it was not way the right way to handle it and has since uh took a step to remediate that 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 clear failure um 
Where you fall on a lot of this, though, is once again an interpretation of your personal decision of, of what is good and what isn't good. Um, did did you follow that at all, or? Yeah, um, uh, the, the the chef thing, um, not particularly. Um, I, okay. I, I was I was kind of vaguely aware that it was happening, but it's not actually my field much. So it was more kind of pay attention to the news, and there's been a lot of news to pay attention to recently, although mostly political rather than technological um but i think this is an example of a wider discussion that's going on in the rest of the world it's not just a free software thing i mean people have been asking for years whether there should be an ethical basis in science research for example and sure. again historically um the 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 larger proportion of the scientific research community has very much like the larger proportion of the free software community taking a very hands-off approach you know it's not we just built the thing it's up to you know we didn't do anything bad with it um but again we've talked in the show in the past about things like yeah maybe you um may maybe you built this thing and you didn't decide what happened to it and that's nothing to do with you if some government or whatever takes it and does something disagreeable with it but it's i think at least it's at least a little bit incumbent on you to not sit down and go, I wonder if I can write some software which does facial recognition and gate recognition to recognise people who were at political rallies and then identify them when they're in the street, right? And then go, oh, I didn't know what use would be put to it when I built this thing. I just did it for a weekend hack project. It's like, stop building this sort of thing. And... and I again I personally I like the idea of having some taking some kind of ethical stance for a better world rather than seeing ourselves the free software development community as being people who just provide tools for someone else to hopefully make a better world with right technology ate the world we now run everything the nerds took over it's not the 1980s <laughs> anymore right no. You're, you're, you're not um if if you're now a computer programmer you're not someone who lives in their parents basement and is mocked you you're a hundred billion dollar vc fund operative right so in addition to this um elevation of status that we've got it would behoove us i think to attempt to shape the conversation rather than just give it bricks for someone else to build with but I do absolutely take your point that it's... I think some of the reason people have shied away from this in the past is because it's hard. Um, it, is so it, it is genuinely difficult to... Uh, even apart from the, the feeling of lawyers who, who very definitely want a bright line test. They want to be able to say, are we compliant and have the answer be a clear yes or a clear no? You're not allowed a, we're not right. sure, <laughs> answer in the middle. But, yeah. but even apart from... Uh, businesses and uh, legal structures who want that sense of surety um, and therefore need a set of rules which are unambiguous, I think it's at least a little bit incumbent upon us as a community to remember the reasons why we're creating free software in the first place. Creating free software is not the point. It's it, it's an epiphenomenon. It's a, um, it's a, a tool we're using to achieve the actual goal which is that everyone has access to the things that they need no one is disenfranchised no one is locked out um certainly when the biggest problem facing your average user of computers was that software was proprietary um very american focused expensive <clears throat> and therefore they didn't have access to it then a good way of solving that problem was to say software will be free of charge freely redistributable um available to everybody there is no way that a company can keep it away from you and so you so you create the gpl which not only enforces people's access to it but enforces people's continuing access to it um but I'm honestly not sure that the biggest problem we face in the software world now is the fact that most software is proprietary and locked down and expensive and unavailable to people. Half the universe is open source, for goodness sake. It is. So, 
is the current free software definition the best way of achieving the actual underlying goal? And I'm not sure I think sure an even broader question, free software aside, is licensing the best way to enact the social change that people want here? Uh, yeah, that is a bigger question. Um, and the answer is, it might not be, but when all you have is a hammer everything looks like a nail. I mean, we, we've sort of decided upon um, licensing and copyright law as a way of enforcing things because it's one of the only enforceable tools that we have access but, to. I would disagree with that vehemently. I don't think it's an enforceable tool in the context of the conversation that we're having right now. I, I cannot imagine there's an entity out there that says, yeah, it's gr I, I'm fine with torturing people, but where I draw the line is copyright infringement and <laughs> IP hygiene, right? That's not realistically not a thing. Once it's open okay, source, I, I shouldn't it's, have it's laughed out there. at that, but yeah, <laughs> right, I, I, I mean, take your point. <laughs> but I mean, realistically, once you release something as open source software, it's out there. And I don't see a way from a licensing perspective to enforce the social part of this that people... I see why they want to enforce it, and I don't in any way, shape, or form disagree with it. I just think... I, I don't think licensing is going to be as effective as maybe we would like in, in this particular I, context. I, no, I certainly agree licensing is not... is considerably less effective um, at achieving the goal of stopping the immigration people from using your software if you want to. But... As far as I'm aware, if you're a software author, you have literally no other way to influence a group like that. There's nothing else you can do. All you have control over is writing the software in the first place and sure. the license you put it under. And I, I mentioned a little bit about don't build software which is obviously usable for this sort of thing. We talked about this a lot when we talked about face recognition. But, right, we're not we're not talking facial recognition here. With yeah. Jeff, we're talking orchestration software. Yeah, exactly. Is, right. I mean, I, I, infrastructure I, bits here. Yes. Uh, at no point am I pointing the finger at someone, who, uh, the people who build Ansible or something, and say you should right. stop doing that because it could be used for bad things. Right? Yeah. But you know, it's like stopping making steel because you make guns out of it. It's not like that. <laughs> um, so the only other tool you've got. Well, so there are two other tools in theory, I think. There's licensing and there's social pressure generally. But if you attempting to use social pressure as a goal to influence the government is from 10,000 feet in the air, a definition of what politics is. People are already doing that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so it's not that I think licensing is the best tool. I just don't know any others. I'd like, I'd love there to be others. Just what, what can, what can I do to influence ICE about what, about whether they use my software or not? Not that I think they're going, Oh, that color picker thing. That's bloody brilliant. We need that. Um, but, <laughs> don't you tell yeah, me. No, I, I mean, I, so this is why in the beginning of the segment, I, I think that this is an interesting conversation to have because unlike a lot of the stories that most of us in the, in the open source world uh, have been through a lot of those stories were at least in, in people of our age a lot of those stories were already beginning to be written when we got involved right where i think this is a story that the beginning starts now what we do with this story is, is up to us as a group of individuals but i think it's interesting to be part of the beginning of a story and, and which is a, a little bit new here there, there hasn't been a lot of new movements recently and this potentially i think could be one of them it, it, absolutely i'm um, as um, to, to quote matt garrett from his post he says i don't have solutions for these problems and i don't know for sure that it's possible to solve them without causing more harm than good in the process and then goes on to say if free software is going to maintain relevance it needs to continue to explain how it interacts with contemporary social issues if any organization is going to claim to lead the community it needs to be doing that and yep. yeah i mean i think uh, you, the, the the point you raised earlier about maybe someone creates a not orthogonal but related but different ethical software movement which you can imagine taking a lot of tips from, say, the environmental movement. Sure. Um, and, and whether that leads to um, uh, some people just doing quite good work to build software, as we've seen at the moment, and other people becoming the software equivalent of Extinction Rebellion, I don't know. But Yeah. It, the, the, the distinction he makes about doing more harm than good is, is interesting, too, because for every person that pulls software 
to protest ICE or to, uh, you know, stop an oppressive regime or whatever it is. They're also pulling it from people saving lives. And, yeah. you know, for every bad organization <laughs> using it, there's going to be good organizations using it as well. So just blanket pulling it, while it proves a point, I guess, you're also hurting a lot of organizations doing a lot of good in the process, which... Yeah. Is it is it in the end worth it? That's a personal decision that doesn't have a yes no answer, but it is I think part of what complicates the the discussion a little bit. Yeah. But uh, but your your point <clears throat> is the fundamental one, I think that yes, I don't think anyone's got any obvious answer at the moment. There is no silver bullet here. Some people are trying things, but what those things do, and this includes um Mongo identifying the free software definition as having a gapingly great big hole in it um, from their business point of view. I mean, yes, um, Garrett explicitly says that he's not that partic- he's not particularly that sympathetic to them. I'm not as sympathetic to them either, but they have a point. Um, whether they're going about solving it the right way or not, I don't know, and we can argue about it, but th- I, think there is a, I think there is a valuable discussion to be had here, and the fact that it's just getting started is a good one. It is. So I, I'm curious, do you think that given where the FSF is now, that they are the correct, should this be the FSF? Should this be the OSI? Should this be a different working group? Should like, where, where in an ideal world to you, who would be the driver behind something like this? Um, or would it be a completely new entity that doesn't exist right now? Uh, I think if the FSF end up spearheading this charge, they would have to be a radically different FSF to the point that they might as well be a different organisation that just inherits the name. I don't I don't really think there's anyone currently in a position to spearhead this. Um and this is problematic because one of the things we've learned about basically every industry and every organizational thing anywhere is that the People who have an exist, people who have a certain amount of power at the moment, don't like giving it up. And so, what we're going to see is a bunch of fights over essentially who gets to be kingmaker in this new organisation or this new movement, and will lose, will lose energy and will lose forward progress on the actual fight we ought to be having in favour of having a fight amongst one another. Yes. So, so as I said, obviously very nuanced topic, and I think just at the beginning of the story here, I'm genuinely curious what the Bad Voltage <laughs> listeners think yes. of this. Uh, I think this is something that could lead to a lengthy discussion in the forum, so if you have any thoughts, head to community.badvoltage.org. Let us know what you think about, uh, after you read Matt Garrett's post and, and listen to this segment, curious, any feedback that you would have, we're listening. Yes, go and talk to us. Should we, uh, should we talk about some news things? <laughs> We should talk about some news things. Well, I have an interesting one, first of all. Um, okay. This is kind of... I don't, know, I don't know what you call it. I mean, I think I call it real-life SEO. It's, it's weird. So, uh, I suspect anyone who's paid some attention to the current uh, dustbin fire that is UK politics <laughs> and, and Brexit will have heard the thing about... Um, when the Brexit referendum happened about uh, them painting £350 million for the NHS on the side of a bus, right? Yes. And then a while back, when... Um, now, was, now I, I need to check here, because I'm not sure whether it was while Johnson was running for... Pro, while Boris Johnson was running for Prime Minister, or after he became... Pro, oh, no, it was while he was running for Prime Minister. Right? It was just, just before. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, while, while while the actual leadership contest was going on, Boris Johnson yeah. gave a weird interview. Where, Super weird. Where, and one of the things he talked about was how he liked to make model buses out of cardboard boxes. A lot of people were like, that's weird. And a couple of people at the time said, I'll tell you why he's doing this. He's doing this so when people search for Boris Johnson bus, the thing which comes up is this weird interview because it's recent as opposed to a million pictures of him standing next to a red bus with a lie painted on the side of it. And I thought at the time, huh, you might be right, but that seems quite technologically savvy and quite tinfoil hatty. And so I didn't believe it. Now, fast forward to this week (laughs) where, um, 
what one of the immense Mount Everest of piled up scandals going on in the UK at the moment is that Boris Johnson, current Prime Minister of the UK, while he was Mayor of London a few years ago, um, diverted, uh, 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 made a, some kind of government monetary award for technology, for technology funding, to uh, a, a woman named Jennifer R. Curie, who runs a, a company called Hacker House. Um, and so a bunch of... Um, generally scandalous mismanagement financial stuff around that as it was like um she was a mate of his and he didn't say anything about it and it was supposed to be for uk firms and they're a us firm who happened to have a uk office and so on and so forth and then it came out that apparently they were ha well it's been alleged that johnson and rqa were having an affair and so you had uh, if you search for boris johnson model then you got a million news stories about this, right? And then, uh, this was uh, two days ago, Johnson gave an interview in which he called himself a model of restraint, which was <laughs> quoted everywhere. Yeah, Johnson calls himself model of restraint in, in a row over Brexit language. And that row is in itself, he's moronic, I can't believe it. But I'm not going to go into what that row was about. But he called himself a model of restraint, which he wasn't. But now you search for Boris Johnson model, and what you get is a bunch of news articles saying PM model of restraint amid Parliament yep. language row and so on. And it's just sort of real life SEO, right? Yeah. Isn't this so interesting? This is really shortly after, worrying. <laughs> shortly after that Boris Johnson bus uh, <laughs> bizarre interview, and if you haven't seen it, look it up because it is genuinely perplexing. <laughs> the top ten results on Google for Boris Johnson bus did not mention in any way, shape, or form the buses. They all mentioned that interview. Yeah. So it's something that I, at the time, seemed weird, and in retrospect, I, this may be someone on his staff may have had a stroke of genius and this is a new thing that we're going to have to deal with. Yeah. Genuinely fascinating though. I, I had never heard of real life SEO, I guess, for lack of a better word. Yeah. But I mean, I'm not sure what, I'm not sure what appears people, to work. Yeah. I'm not sure what people are calling it. That's just what I called it when I thought of it, but that seems to be it. If, you know, if, if you can't do the right to be forgotten thing, because you have no right to be forgotten because you did this and there were news articles about it, but you want to get them out of the news then pick the important word that everyone remembers and use it in some other outrageous but different context. And then right. it changes what the news reports are. What's, what's going to be interesting is, as far as I can tell, this is basically aimed at Google. This is why I called it Real Life SEO. Um, yep. None of the old articles go away or anything. It's just changing what comes up when you search for things. So I wonder if Google will see this as manipulative and start putting in things to deal with it I and mean, that's a really I mean, ticklish problem real, for them realistically to deal in in a world of endless content obscurity and deletion are the same thing right yeah okay good way of putting so it. it is a way to not delete but put it into obscurity and it's I, there's a weird perversion here where the more famous you are the the thing about google is it really trusts sources that it considers credible so if you're able to get an interview with the bbc yeah. which the prime minister of england turns out not that difficult to do <laughs> it suddenly is very easy to word things weirdly and make fake model buses yeah and then there's an interview and then because it was on bbc cnn and whomever else will cover it and pretty soon there's a thousand highly regarded entities reporting on this thing so it happens like in days yeah is the other fascinating part about it yeah, and this, this is the thing. I mean, and, uh, we, we will link to um, the thing which alerted me to this in the in the show notes, which was a, a tweet by um, Andy <clears throat> Maturin, um, and he he shows two screenshots of a search for Boris Johnson model before and after this story, and it changed within the space of an hour. The I am now curious to your point if Google will cluster better and understand that there are two very prevalent bus related Boris Johnson items and surface results in a way that highlights the them. The highlights them both rather than just saying this is the stuff that happened most recently. I mean, this is a hard problem for them to deal with because it's not that they can say 
the thing which has happened more recently is not news, because it is. Um, completely apart from the fact that Google are not supposed to be the arbiter of this, they're trusting existing news sources. The existing it's a whole new- other segment. Which is a whole other segment, a whole other 400 <laughs> segments, and possibly the fundamental yes. problem facing humanity over the next 10 years. But yes. um, even the, um, the, the news sources themselves, it's not like you can have a go at them, because... Honestly, if the PM says anything, it's news. It's the same as, you know, if the president uh, in the the US says anything. That's news in the US. Whatever they say publicly is news by definition as public servants. Yes. Turns out if I make model buses, no one's interested. No, no, no one cares. It um, it is not on BBC. I I expect to see... um, Jono doing loads of interviews where he mentions the word sheep in an innocuous context. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, um, I thought this was interesting. Again, this is going to be a show in which we go, here is a problem. We have no solution for this problem. The world is terrible. <laughs> yeah, but I, we are, A theme is forming. <laughs> will, will the next news story follow this theme and go? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, the next one is about Gnome. Uh, who are currently being sued by a software patent agency whose um, whose name I, I I can't remember and not but wasn't particularly interested in writing down. But this is about Shotwell, which is the photo editor, and the patent that this company holds is on a method of capturing images, filtering them on a topic, theme, or individual, and then wirelessly transmitting the filtered images to another device. Um, stupid. Which is stupid. I mean, to me... Which is definitely not obvious. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, to me, it's interesting how um, there seems to be this... Uh, ignoring all the other massive loopholes in the patent system. There seems to be a massive loophole in the patent system, which is <clears throat> describe anything at all that a computer can do and then put the word wirelessly on the end of it and then go, this is yes. a whole new unobvious thing <clears throat> that we're allowed a patent. Um, so yeah, this is obvious to me. This is not a method anyway. This is doing a thing and then connecting the computer it's onto the network. That's not a thing. It's two things. But whatever. Anyway, um, they're being sued. Obviously, um, Neil McGovern, <coughs> uh, who's head of the Gnome Foundation, has said words. Oh, well, I, 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 I don't want to. I don't want to misquote him here since this is a legal case. So uh, I will say he described the suit as baseless. And said that yes. Gnome would vigorously defend against it, which is good. And it I, should I be noted gonna, they're not yeah. they're not just suing uh, Gnome on this; they're suing Mag- Magics, and there was some uh, another yeah, organization yeah, yeah, as yeah. well. They've previously sued Sony and, and Walt Disney, so clearly a, a shell organization intent on just suing people with uh, <laughs> somewhat absurd patents. Yeah. So initially, when I read this, I didn't think it was going to be a very interesting story. Uh, patent troll sues. Open Source Foundation, I guess, is a little more interesting to us than Patent Troll Sue's normal corporation in Sony or, or whatever. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> I read something in doing a little bit of, of research for the show that struck me in a way that had never struck me before. I think most of us are anti-software patent in general. And someone proposed that is the real question whether software patents are good or bad or just that the way that software patents work is garbage. Because I think we've, as a society, decided patents are good. They, they they are beneficial for society in multiple ways. With software eating the world and now software-defined things are everywhere. It's not networking gear anymore. It's software-defined networking. And that applies to everything. As you said, technology has taken over. Software has won. Yeah. Is the problem software patents or is the so- problem that software patents as designed are stupid? And what I mean by that is if there was a patent system for software that obviously had a much shorter cycle than than hardware patents because software revs way faster and that didn't immediately grant patents to ridiculous tiny algorithms that are so broad that they make no sense, but where there was actual research done and very complicated software systems, not algorithms, were patentable in a way that released quickly would the benefit of having that software be opened after the fact, because that's how patents work, actually be beneficial enough to have a well-functioning, well-designed, retooled patent system designed from the ground up for software from scratch? Would that be a good or bad thing? I'm well. You see, I'm not as reflexively <laughs> anti-software patents as some members of the community. Um, I, I think if yeah, if 
the Archangel Gabriel came down and went, here is a well-designed software pattern system where you can hold a pattern on a thing for, uh, I don't know, two years or something, and then after that it becomes free for everybody to use, and um, the the organising and awarding bodies um, have <coughs> enough technological, technical nous to recognise when something is just stupid and when things fail the laugh test and throw those things out, I'd be tentatively in favour of it. Now, a lot of people in our community would not, would say it's the worst thing ever. But I think if you spend a bunch of time um, developing uh, some some brilliant new uh, method of doing AI or of facial recognition, since we mentioned it earlier, or something like that, um, I think it is reasonable that you should be able to hold a small monopoly on that for a while. Um, and at the moment, the way you get to hold a small monopoly on that for a while is by not publishing your software, right? But also by not right. publishing your software source code. So anything yes. anything that anyone wants to keep secret is by definition proprietary. This, I mean, this is literally what the word proprietary means, and yes. and what we want to do is encourage more people to release stuff as open source, right? So if you can release it as open source, but say, no, it's patented. So you can use our software, but what you can't do is um, build your own version. Then, okay, but what I don't know is how you square that with the open source kind of concept. You know, if if someone publishes their, their new algorithm on GitHub, and then I take it and change one line in it, is that me violating their patent or exercising my free software rights? And I don't know the answer to that question, and I'm not sure that it is answerable is the problem, which means that um, all that would change, so the software would, if if I'm right there, then all that would change is the software would stay proprietary, and all we're doing is we're saying, okay, we're going to basically keep the software patterns thing the way it is now, except we're going to shorten it to two years rather than 17, which I'm totally in favour of, let's be clear, but if... In general, the world was in favour of that. We'd have done it already. <laughs> well, well, no, I think part of it is that the patent system in the United States, as designed now, I think has reverted for a variety of reasons from defunding to, to other things to we will grant almost every single patent that is applied for, yeah, software or otherwise, and then let lawyers figure it out after the fact through litigation, which results in patent trolls. So I think the first step would be fixing that that would only grant patents that are legitimate. I And changing what should be patentable from a software perspective, and then also changing the term. Those are three very large changes. That, they're very large. Yeah, so I think, yeah, the thing you described, um, if it existed, would I be in favour of it? Tentative, yes, I think. But, but I, I, it was the just description's doing I a had, lot of work in that sentence. Yes, right? oh, for, for sure, but... <laughs> It changes the conversation from software patents aren't terrible, let's get rid of them, to the system's completely <laughs> broken and needs to be fixed, which are two way different pitches. I, you see, I'm not sure they are. I think that distinction is software patents are de facto terrible and software patents are de jure terrible. Um, but if what you've got is a world in which it could in theory be great, but in practice anything that anyone comes up with is going to be terrible then there's no point in fighting for Utopia because you'll never get there. You might as well just fight the concept as a whole. And I, again, I mean, I don't know where I fall on that, but there is some stuff where I can imagine um, a way in which it could be done well, but I can also not imagine that way ever actually happening in practice. But if you say that as part of the conversation, you're essentially weakening your argument because the other side won't do that so hmm. I, I always feel slightly uneasy about that sort of thing because it make to to a third party observer if i say yeah you've got some good points but i think on balance it's a bad thing and they go no we only have good points What's supposed to happen is the outside observer goes, wow, they look really arrogant and unwilling to compromise. Yep. But what actually yep. happens is the outside observer goes, well, they seem very sure of themselves and they seem very wishy-washy. 
So, and that's changed in the last 10 years or so, right? This flip out. So, the way you argue about things has in itself changed quite a lot. And so, methods of argument need to update to stay current with the times, otherwise, you just lose arguments. That's very, very, very generic now. <laughs> right. But I, th- I think it feeds well, into the same principle. This continues to be an uplo- uh, uplifting episode here. <laughs> Wow. So, um, what's next? Another cheery one. Another cheery one. So, dating app maker uh, Match has been sued by the FTC for fraud. And so, it's uh, the U.S. Federal Trade Commission. I'm reading from TechCrunch here. I'll include the the link in the show notes again. Uh, announced that it uh, sued the Match Group, which is the owner of, quote-unquote, just about all of the dating apps. Yes. Including Match, Tinder, OkCupid, Hinge, Plenty of Fish, and others for fraudulent business practices. And it turns out, basically, that Match didn't just turn a blind eye to the massive bots and scammers problems, etc. It actually knowingly profited from it and in some places actually participated in it. And uh, their contention is that they made deceiving users a core part of their business practice. So uh, it it claims... uh, some of the th- things in the claim were that up to 30%, so if almost a full third of the registrations were completely fake, not real people, and that they did things like after you shut down your account, have a bunch of better looking people than would have sent you messages before, send you messages, so you re-signed up, and then when you looked at the message, the accounts were deactivated already. Yeah. It's, I, I mean, I this is, this is going to be an interesting one because um, uh, unlike, I imagine, you and uh, unlike John, oh, were he here? I've actually used a bunch of these dating apps. Um, <clears throat> and they're all, first of all, yeah, they're all owned by Match. And secondly, they're all terrible. God. Um, <laughs> but yes, I think, I think most people using them know that they will deliberately show you pictures of people who didn't actually message you and sort of imply that they did in order that you'll sign up for something or you know you'll sign up to read messages or to see who's viewed you or whatever and it it didn't it honestly never occurred to me that this sort of thing was actionable i just thought yeah okay they're a bunch of lying bastards everyone knows they're a bunch of lying bastards i suppose we just have to put up with it it never occurred to me that you could go, that's fraud, but let's be clear about this, that's fraud. Well done for well done to the FTC for stepping up on this. And I had no idea the numbers were so high. I mean twenty five no, to thirty. So first I didn't realise that all of the dating apps were owned by one company, to yeah, be honest. Um they they went on a buying spree uh, over the last five years. So Match was originally a dating app, uh, as I understand it. And then they they bought OK Cupid and they bought plenty of fish. Uh, and they bought Hinge. I don't think they own Bumble, which is one of the other big ones. Um, but yeah. Uh, so is there room for a we are an honest app here? Uh, the There could be, but I think it, I think that's like saying, is there room for an honest second-hand car dealer? Yeah, there totally is. But if you put up a sign going, I am an honest second-hand car dealer. No one will be able to say it because of all the signs from the other dishonest second-hand car dealers saying, I am an honest second-hand car dealer, right? It's not that it shouldn't exist. It's that even if it does exist, you don't get any points for it because nobody believes you because the whole industry has no credibility. Um, so it's just another series of we thought technology was going to enable better conversations and interlink humanity in a positive way and it all turns out to be a tire fire of lies and fraud uh, yeah and t- so the show is just continuing in a great <laughs> great direction this is totally it man I, I hope he you know Jono comes back next time I hope he brings us cakes or something otherwise I'm going to burst into tears <laughs> um, but yeah I mean this is um one of the reasons Bumble is interesting is because it's driven by women. So uh, men don't get to message first, for example. Oh, okay. Um, which is, uh, completely apart from fraud, is a genuinely good idea, because as far as I can tell, all men are terrible people. Having seen inboxes on some of these apps from um, from women who are friends of mine, you're like, what's wrong with you people? Fucking pack it in. <laughs> um but yeah, no, it, it's. I hope something comes of this. But I'm. I honestly feel like it's like. Um, it's like secondhand car dealerships. Um, 
I think largely be- because a a dating app is at least partially driven by being popular. If it's not popular, it doesn't matter how good it is because nobody's on it. Right? Sure. Um, it's like a social network, and so um, it's hard to it's hard to bootstrap yourself. It's hard to get off the ground, especially when you're dealing with competition from people who've got loads and loads and loads and loads and loads of stuff. It's even harder if that competition are being deliberately fraudulent in order to drive sales and money. Um, but it, I'd like to see something happen here, but in practice, not. I don't think it's going to. So maybe all the best we can hope for is that Match gets some kind of massive kicking <laughs> and then go, okay, maybe we'll be less less match than we are at the moment. Less match. <laughs> I hope so. Um, and then um, our final news item for today, I think, was something that I thought was interesting because it's something that we talked about before. Um, a while back, we spoke about the uh, the announcements of the Google Assistant uh, ha- handling ringing up restaurants for you. So you'd hold your phone and say, okay, Google book me a place at Langan's on Friday. And it would then make a phone call to the restaurant for you and then walk through a conversation. They were very excited about the clever AI that allowed them to hold a conversation. And um, we as a team had some reservations. I think I had more than the two of you, but I think I had more than you and you had more than Jono, as I recall. Yes. Um, but uh, because of a lot of the pushback on that, I thought they quietly canned that program. But now it turns out there's a thing called Reserve with Google. And what that seems to be, it's a bit hard to find out information about this. Um, cause it seems to have either been soft launched or it's sort of being beta tested. But as far as I can tell what that is, is instead of you explicitly asking the Google Assistant to do it, um, you're making a booking um, on the web, essentially. When you're searching for restaurants, it will show you a book a place at this restaurant. So, but instead of sending you off to Open Table or whatever, it'll do it all inside the Google interface. You say book it at seven PM on Friday. It will then, presumably from its servers rather than from your device, make that same Google Assistant phone call to a restaurant, walk through the conversation, and book you in. However, again, as far as I can tell, and it's hard to find out stuff about this. A bunch of the restaurants who are in this, no one seems to know how a restaurant gets in this program and how they don't. A bunch of restaurants seem to have been put in this program without necessarily being told that they're in this program. Which is bizarre. Which which is which is weird. Um a a bunch of people have been using it to make bookings and they show up at the restaurant and the restaurant has no record of it at all. They didn't get a phone call or something, don't really know. It's very, very unclear. Um so I understand why Google think, yeah, we can. Um, we, people don't like making phone calls, and it's so much easier to just press a button, and we can have a thing do it. But it's terrible. But the thing which put this, which really brought this home to me, is um, the, the 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 thread, the discussion about it. I was reading, pointed out how bad this is for small restaurants, because especially on um, you know some weekday evening or something. A th- a four person booking, which isn't a real one, can make or break the difference between mm. you having a proper evening or not. I mean, I was um right. There are a few um independent restaurateurs. Well, there are millions of independent restaurateurs here in Birmingham, but a few that I follow, and mm-hmm. I was quite surprised at how narrow the margins are. Be- oh, absolutely. Between this was a great evening that we had, super profitable, everyone was really happy, the restaurant felt great, and this evening was a ditch, and it was terrible. And that might be two bookings. Yeah, you know? oh no, for sure. Yeah, which, which I... Especially on a weekday. I didn't, uh, yeah, I didn't at first appreciate. Completely apart from the fact that... Um, you, you're also having people deal with taking phone calls from a robot, to which you can't ask complicated questions to at all so if you're the booker no. you can't say right. you, uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff that you may want to ask you don't want to and it feels a bit like 
a power grab on Google's part because I don't believe there mm. are that many restaurants now that don't have some kind of online booking system. I don't think Google is rescuing restaurants who can't afford to get online and just do things by a pho by phone and say, look, we're opening up the world of internet booking to you. It feels like what they're doing is going, we don't want to drive people to your website. We want to keep them inside Google's UI. So I, I do think they're trying to move a lot of things to assistant in a way that I personally don't like, but I don't use, a, like, we've we've had this conversation before. Yeah. Jono seems to be the only one I know that likes assistant, <laughs> and he really, really likes it and uses it all the time. After the one segment, I used the Google Assistant screener once, and I felt like a terrible, dirty human being for having done so. <laughs> Just was curious how it worked, but... I, I, I partially agree there. I, I also don't understand why increasingly Google so, seems to be so terrible at rolling things out. So this seems like something, if you're going to interject yourself into the livelihood of, of other humans, I don't know why on the restaurant side, this wouldn't be completely opt-in with a very specific set of parameters. I don't know why they would, this, some, this is something that you can't release before it's ready in the wild because people will use it once, think it's terrible, and then never use it again. But they seem to be organizationally getting worse at rolling things out in general. They just released dark mode for Gmail, for instance, way later than I would have suspected for something so simple. But they made this huge announcement for it. Everyone, you know, it's going to be great. Finally, we have dark theme for Gmail. And then rolled it out in a way that I still don't have it. Yeah. I mean, perfect. And it just seems like their rollouts are, are not good. A perfect example of this, right? <clears throat> this very conversation that we're having now. Okay, the way we record that, so I draw back the curtain a little bit on the on, <laughs> on, on the mighty um, coruscation of orbiting mind control technology that runs bad voltage towers. The way we actually do this recording is we have uh, what used to be a Google Hangout where we could all see one another and then we all record locally. So I'm recording in Audacity, Jeremy's in something, whatever. Jono uses Audacity. Yeah, Jono uses um, Cubase. Whatever. And then we each um, bundle up the um, the save files, send them over to Jono, he does the mixing. But the, the live conversation, so we can hear one another, is done through what used to be Google Hangouts. Now, at some point in the past, um, Google deprecated Google Hangouts. It's not actually, according to killedbygoogle.com, be best website on earth, um, <laughs> uh, according to kill killedbygoogle.com, Google Hangouts isn't actually dead until December 2020. But it, it was coughing up blood last night right it's on its last legs yes. at this point um so we used to have a regular google hangout scheduled and at some point it got changed to meet.google.com i think that yes. i think that was done by i think it was done by Jono because he sorted out that that regular um calendar invite okay so jeremy and i showed up clicked on the link Jono's not here um i got into this meet.google.com meeting wouldn't let jeremy in and so we said uh, so we're, 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 we're talking in another channel as well and going, okay, what do you mean it won't let you in? I'm just there. <laughs> just press the button. And then we said, okay, fine, let's just set up another one. Both of us go to meet.google.com and it says in there, your account only lets you join meetings. Neither of us have the permissions to create a meeting. So, we're currently having a conversation on hangouts.google.com. <laughs> Hooray. Yes. Back to the old standard. And when it goes away, I'm sure we're going to start using talkie.io or appear.in, which is now whereby, um, if this yes. situation comes but, up again. E even odder, I, I would say both of us are fairly familiar with computers. <laughs> Let's go with. We, w we went to this, this search engine also run by the same company, which you think would be able to search their own documentation well, and search for the exact error message that we got. Your account only lets you join meetings. And it brought us to a page that says, go to admin.google.com and do this and do that. And the page that it tells you to go to just flat doesn't even exist. So I... It's yeah. Here, here we are in a hangout. It's uh, it's crazy. that was well timed for our last story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can say yeah, Google. Um, I would say try not to screw us technologically on a time when we're talking about a bad Google service. But I think we talk about a bad Google service in every episode now, worryingly, or at least touch on this. Hence, yes. hence, it does, hence the it does Google seem like graveyard. It. I mean, looking at this, you're looking at um the Google graveyard killed by Google. Um. I do know what half this stuff is. And I think it's good that they start up services, try them out, and then kill them. That's the way it's got to be. You shouldn't keep things running forever. 
just right. just because. And, and everyone's got their own pet thing they're really annoyed about, whether it's Google Reader or presumably there are still people somewhere crying their eyes out about Orcut going away or something. But <laughs> Oh, Orcut. Wow, you're kicking it old school there. There's still people in Brazil that are really mad about that. <laughs> uh, oh, the Google URL shortener. Um, but... Um, right. People were mad about Hangouts on Air. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, but there's a bunch of stuff Go- in here. Google Trips. Yeah, it's like, oh, Google Bulletin. Oh, no. What happened to that? I've got no idea. Never heard of it. Don't know what it was either. Um, but it's. You ever hear of Google Tez? No. <laughs> Hadn't heard of that one either. No, I don't know what half this stuff is. But it it is good that they get to start things and then kill them and so on. Um, you've got to try that, especially if you're as big as Google. Um, but. It's still kind of annoying, you know? <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't necessarily know how you solve this problem. I mean, I, I honestly don't know how you solve it. You ever it. hear of Google Pie? Not to monopolize this segment now with odd things I never heard of. <laughs> Google Pie killed over three years ago. Pie was a work-centric group, group site chat, an app comparable in a competitor to Slack. Really? Yeah. Didn't compete very well, did it? I, uh, evidently not. Yeah. And free anyway. Freebase, which is a really <clears throat> sad one because that got built up. And, I, I built a project once on Freebase. It was it was a, um, a collaborative structured data thing. Think of it as sort of Wikipedia. But yeah, no, Freebase data. was good. Yeah, and, and I used it before Google ever bought it. We built I built a couple of projects which used the resources in it uh, in various ways. And then Google bought it and then killed it off. Boom, dead. Oh, yeah, his pie. Okay, w- one last Google killed fun fact here. This is getting funny. You mentioned Orkut. What year do you think they killed it? Or- I was wildly off. Orkut, um, 2015? Yeah. Oh, you? I, I would have thought 2010. 2014? Yeah, you see, no. Wow. It, 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 it staggered along for a long time, I think. Yeah, it, it made it over a decade. <laughs> so, um, no more whining about Google dying. Um, <laughs> are you, um, uh, uh, bef- before we close up, are you speaking anywhere in the next couple of weeks? Not in the next couple of weeks. The next event I'm speaking at is uh, open. S- oh, no, actually, yeah, all, all things open. I'll be speaking at about how Datadog started an open source uh, internship program to help enable the next generation of open source contributors. So I will be speaking at open source. Uh, all things, all open. things open about that. Cool. And then uh, Open Source Summit EU in Lyon. I will be on a panel with a few other folks from open source programs offices around the world. Excellent. Well, that sounds good. Yeah. Um, How about you? Uh, well, I have I have just got back from speaking at JS Camp RO, which was in Romania, where I'd never been, and that was very, very cool. But I'm also speaking very at nice. Inclusive Design 24, which is um, an online conference, no less. Uh, 24 hours. Um, so there's uh, yep. so they've got 24 different slots. And someone doing a talk in each in each of the hours, and that's on the tenth of October, and I'm doing that. So, oh, cool. We participate in All Day DevOps, which is a similar 24 hour online thing. That oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. It's good laugh. Okay. So, so if you haven't had enough of myself and Stuart Langridge on this show, that's how you get just a little bit extra. <laughs> that's how you get more of us. Um, hopefully, John, I will be back for the next show. We will find out, but um, <laughs> your guess is as good as ours. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's terribly unfair. We're looking forward to having you back, John. And so, yes, um, go to community.badvoltage.org and tell us what you think about where free software should be going or any of the other stories we've talked about. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for listening.